committee will uh, come to order. Uh, today's hearing on American Jobs Now, H.R. 3548, the North American Energy Access Act, is being held pursuant to Rule 11 of the House Rules at the request of Mr. Rush, Mr. Waxman, and other members of the minority. Although we gave opening statements at the first hearing pursuant to an agreement uh, between the minority and the majority, each side this morning will be given 10 minutes for opening statements. And at this time, I'd like to recognize myself for five minutes for the purpose of making an opening statement. Like many people, I was quite disappointed when the President decided the Keystone Pipeline was not in the national interest, and the reason that he gave for making that decision was that there was not enough time to collect and review information regarding the route through Nebraska. We all are very much aware, however, that the application for the permit was filed in September of 2008. That was almost three and a half years ago. As a matter of fact, as far back as October 2010, in a speech at the Commonwealth Club of San Francisco, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, in response to a question, said that she was inclined to approve the permit for the Keystone Pipeline based on the information she had. I also want the public to know, and I'm sure they're very much aware of this also, that five major labor unions support it and still support the building of this pipeline. In an article entitled Labor Civil War Over Keystone XL, the author reported some of President Barack Obama's biggest labor supporters are fuming over his decision. Unions representing construction workers that would directly benefit from building the pipeline, as he said in his article, feel stabbed in the back by unions that joined environmental groups to kill the project. Laborers International Union of North America General President Terry O'Sullivan said the decision was so repulsive and disgusting that he was going to pull his union out of the Blue-Green Alliance, a coalition of environmental groups and labor unions that represented nearly all of the groups that signed a statement, a joint statement, supporting the president. Mr. Sullivan said, unions and environmental groups that have no equity in this work have kicked our members in the teeth, and anger is an understatement as to how we feel about it. We will not sit at the table with people that destroy our members' livelihood. The labor unions supporting the project East issued a particularly forceful statement condemning the decision as politics at its worst. And Mr. Sean Sweeney, who is the director of Global Labor Institute at Cornell University, uh, who did a study about the jobs that this would create, made it very clear when he said that this decision was really about the president being reelected. The president's reelection is at stake. And he said there is certainly more at stake here than a simple pipeline. In closing, I would simply like to quote from an editorial in Chicago Tribune Keystone should be approved. This is a good project. It will give us energy and give us jobs. You want stimulus? This is it. This is a $7 billion project to be done with private dollars, taxpayer dollars will not be used. President Obama made a decision that we think is the wrong decision. And uh, with that, I would, uh, does anyone seek recognition for a minute and 48 seconds? No, I'll recognize you later. All right. If you seek, uh, sure, Mr. Yield, Chairman. I'll yield and balance my time to you, Mr. Chairman. You know, I, I thank the gentleman for uh, yielding. I appreciate his comments. I was just uh, reviewing the testimony by, uh, I believe it's Mr. Poole from the uh, Bureau of Land Management. And I just find it interesting that uh, how much our government rules and regulations come into play here for so little uh, land. He, he says in his testimony, the total permanent right-of-way on BLM-managed public lands for this Keystone project would be approximately 50 feet wide and comprise a total of approximately 270 acres. Now let that sink at me. You, you, you think about how, how minor a role the federal government's playing in, in terms of this land, uh, and yet 
uh, is, is and they've issued their approvals, my understanding. Final biological assessment has been issued and shows no uh, jeopardy under the Endangered Species Act. Um, federal government, BLM at least, 270 acres here, 50 feet wide. We've got horrible unemployment problem. It's getting a little better, but you know, 8.3 percent is nothing to brag about. You got a $7 million potential investment here of private sector funds that could create thousands of jobs and uh, new property tax base uh, payments to local governments throughout that region. And uh, I, I just think it's time to get this done. So I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Wallen. At this time, I recognize the gentleman from uh, Illinois, Mr. Rush, for five minutes. I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this uh, important hearing that the minority side requested in order to hear from some of the important stakeholders who were not invited to participate in last week's hearing and to shed light on to some of the ramifications of the legislation before us, H.R. 3548. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, this bill is simply another bite at the apple in the majority's in attempt to backdoor the Obama administration and green light a project that has not yet been fully vetted and what would amount to be an application of the federal government's oversight responsibilities. In fact, why don't we simply call this bill for what it really is? Instead of the North American Energy Access Act, this bill should be renamed the Republican in Congress favor to Trans-Canada Act. This bill does not make sense. Legally, it doesn't make sense. Technically, it doesn't make sense because it shifts the responsibility for approving a cross-border pipeline from the State Department to FERC, an agency which has no experience inciting this type of binational project specifically or all pipelines generally. This bill does not make sense practically and it does not make sense morally. As we heard from uh, the Assistant Secretary of State, Carrie Ann uh, Jones, last week, she of the Bureau of Oceans and International Environment and Scientific Affairs the recommendation to deny the permit was made simply because there was not sufficient time for the agency to complete its due diligence and perform its legal oversight responsibility, mainly due to the fact that currently there is not even a proposed route for the State Department to review. It would have been an act of gross negligence and recklessness for the Obama administration to approve a permit for a pipeline that will cut through the heart of the country where when the policymakers in those very states that are mostly affected, like Nebraska, haven't even identified the most appropriate route for the pipeline to go through. While the language the Republicans passed in their initial effort to force the administration to come up with a decision within 60 days of enactment of the middle class payroll tax extension was ill-considered and irresponsible, I must say that the language in this new bill, which was transfer the decision to a different and completely inexperienced agency, FERC, and also require the commission to make a decision within 30 days uh, or the project will be automatically approved is even more irrational and more irresponsible. As Se Assistant Secretary of State Karen Jones stated at last week's hearing regarding her agency's recommend recommendation, and I quote, that decision was based on the fact that the exact route of the pipeline has yet to be identified in critical areas. As a result, there are unresolved concerns for a full range of, energy, of issues 
including energy security, foreign policy, economic effects, health, safety, and environmental impacts, among other considerations. Ms. Jones went on to say, the legislation raises serious questions about legal authority, questions of continuing force of much of the federal and all of the state and local environmental and land use management authority over the pipeline. And Mr. Chairman, I want to emphasize this, it overrides foreign policy and national security considerations implicated by a cross-border permit with a, which are properly assessed by the State Department. Mr. Chairman, with, side, with such dire warnings against this bill, I think we owe it to the American public to fully explain the consequences of this legislation to ensure that the public interest is protected. And with that, I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Mr. Rush. At this time, I'd like to recognize the gentleman from Texas, uh, Mr. Barton, for the purpose of making an opening statement, five minutes. I'm not, I won't use that much time, Mr. Chairman, but thank you. Um, this is a continuation hearing. Everything that can be said about Keystone has been said, uh, but sometimes it needs to be repeated. But this, this is an extremely important project for our, our nation's future. Um, just in the last month or so, we've had a number of uh, announcements that refineries in the United States, in the Northeast, and in the Virgin Islands are going to be closed, uh, several in Pennsylvania, one in the Virgin Islands, I think one in Ohio. Uh, altogether, they're taking about a million barrels of refinery production uh, off the books. And um, while Keystone Pipeline is not building a new refinery, uh, it is bringing additional crude oil uh, to the Gulf Coast where we still have refinery capacity. Uh, that crude oil will be used to uh, be refined into products that then can be transshipped uh, up into the Midwest and the Northeast. Uh, if you shut down refineries in the Midwest and off offshore that, that serve that market, and if you don't build Keystone, that's a double whammy. Uh, the absolute certainty is that prices will go up, shortages will exist, uh, our economy will suffer. On the other hand, if we build the Keystone Pipeline, uh, we're going to have additional crude coming into the United States, approximately 800,000 barrels a day. Uh, it doesn't offset, in totality, uh, the closure of these other refinery facilities, but it will alleviate them. And as my good friend from Oregon, Mr. Walden, has just pointed out, um, to have to go through the bureaucratic red tape that this project has gone through uh, for the reasons it's been subjected to it uh, just doesn't seem to make good, good sense in any way, in any way. So, Mr. Chairman, I look forward to, uh, to the hearing. There's another hearing downstairs on the Chemical Facilities Act um, so I'll be shuffling back and forth, but um, uh, I do appreciate you holding the hearing, and I obviously appreciate uh, uh, being allowed to speak. I'd like to yield uh, the balance of my time to uh, Mr. Terry of Nebraska, who's been a strong voice for this project. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman Emeritus. Uh, just to uh, uh, clarify a few points, uh, the State Department uh, issued three statements uh, over the summer uh, that they would have all of the information and they, they were doing all of the dil due diligence to have uh, a decision made by the end of 2011. And uh, we took them at their word for that and it turned out to be not true. I think one of the uh, key points here that's been missed uh, in the State Department's testimony, uh, in particular in the basis for their decision, is that they're using Nebraska as the excuse to deny the permit. And the reality is in the legislation that the president signed specifically exempted Nebraska out of this, this was going forward on the other parts of the pipeline and the other states. Uh, it carved out a time uh, that, or a trigger that uh, would review the Nebraska portion, the 30 or 40 miles that the pipeline would be moved. Uh, based upon when the governor certified that it was uh, ready. Uh, so I, I'm amazed at 
why that hasn't been brought out. Now, I'm glad that the Corps of Engineers is here today because they do play a vital point and in their testimony raises a valid point that we had already uh, vetted and had planned to change, and that's uh, we want to make it clear that what the legislation does is remove the presidential permission part and gives it to the agency, the uh, federal agency that actually has experience in pipelines. Uh, we, we thought that was a rational approach with this bill. So I want to let the Corps know that we aren't usurping and we will change the language of issuing permits of any project that crosses a waterway under your jurisdiction. Um, so we, we knew there were other permits that they would have to file and receive once the presidential authorization was made. Um, I am disappointed that we invited the Corps of Engineers and the BLM to our hearing last week and they denied or refused to come, but yet when Henry Waxman asks uh, to testify in opposition, you're here loaded for bear. So uh, that concerns me. One last point in my six seconds is uh, I think the message that the president's denial of this permit sent the world is that the far left of the environmental community is now in charge of our energy and foreign policy. I yield back. At this time, I recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. Waxman, for five minutes for the purpose of an opening statement. Mr. Chairman, today we're holding a legislative hearing on a bill to mandate approval of TransCanada's Tar Sands Pipeline Keystone XL. This Tar Sands Pipeline is hugely controversial, and for good reason. The American people will bear the risks, and big oil will reap the rewards. With this pipeline, we get more carbon pollution, more dangerous oil spills, land seizures by a foreign country, and higher oil prices in the Midwest. Big Oil gets the ability to extract more profits from the Midwest, a conduit for exporting tar sands products to China, and the green light to exploit the tar sands at maximum speed regardless of the consequences. President Obama listened to differing views of American citizens and made a responsible decision. He would not approve the pipeline through the ecologically fragile Sand Hills area of Nebraska, but the State Department would consider an alternative route. Nebraska is taking the time to find a route that is acceptable, and the President is making sure that he has all the information he needs to make the right decision. This bill takes the opposite approach. It gives the pipeline an unprecedented regulatory earmark. It directs the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission directs them to approve the pipeline, even though we don't yet know what route it will take through the state of Nebraska. It exempts the pipeline from the requirements to obtain <laughs> permits from the Corps of Engineers before crossing rivers and wetlands. It takes away the Department of Interior's authority to protect sensitive public lands. For a year, I've been asking a simple question. Who benefits from this extraordinary congressional intervention in the regulatory process? Last year, Reuters reported that Coke Industries would be one of the big winners from this earmark. And there's evidence to support this. We know that Coke is one of the largest crude oil exporters in Canada. We know it owns, owns o an oil terminal in Hardesty, Canada, where the pipeline would begin. And we know it has a refinery in Texas, near where the pipeline is going to end. Last May, I contacted Coke to inquire about the nature of its interest in the pipeline. And Coke responded that despite this evidence, to the contrary, it had no financial interest in whether the pipeline was built or not. And I accepted that answer. <laughs> but then I learned that Coke had told the Canadian government that the company had a, quote, direct and substantial interest, end quote, in the pipeline. I want to know why Coke would tell the U.S. Congress one thing and the Canadian government the exact opposite. So I asked Chairman Upton and Chairman Whitfield to invite Coke Industries to testify today. Well, they refused. 
and Koch refused to appear without an invitation from the chairman. So we are left with unanswered questions. Why is Koch Industries being placed in a witness protection program? What does the company have to hide? And why does the company get special treatment while the American people get left in the dark? I also asked the chairman to invite the operator of the pipeline, TransCanada. Members on our side want to ask TransCanada reasonable questions, like what route it plans to follow in Nebraska. We also want to know about these claims of jobs. The State Department testified that we would get five to 6,000 temporary jobs if this pipeline is approved. These jobs would be around for two years. TransCanada said it's going to be 20,000 jobs, over 100,000. And where did they get the number 100,000? Well, that's looking at the lifetime of the pipeline for 100 years. This is the, this is the Republican jobs bill, 20,000 jobs, they say, maybe 100,000 jobs. Yet the State Department did an analysis, and they would say five to 6,000 jobs for two years. I regret that Koch and TransCanada are not here today, and I ask the chairman to refrain from moving this bill until they are available to testify. I'm glad we have uh, excellent witnesses here today who are going to give us their views. The departments, uh, uh, two departments that are going to be excluded from giving their usual review of the project, that might change, I'm pleased to hear, and uh, two gentlemen who have special insight at what this project will mean. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for this uh, seven seconds beyond the time, and I yield back whatever time I have left. Thank you, Mr. Waxman. Today we have two panels of witnesses, and on the first panel, uh, if, you, if those of you on the first panel will come forward, that's Ms. Margaret Gaffney Smith, who's Chief Regulatory for U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, and Mr. Mike Poole, who's Deputy Director, Bureau of Land Management, U.S. Department of the Interior. We appreciate uh, both of you being here with us this morning. And uh, as you know, we're going to ask each of you to give a five-minute opening statement. And uh, at the end of that time, then uh, questions will be asked. I might also point out that we've been told that there will be five or six votes on the House floor uh, somewhere around 11 o'clock or so. But uh, we're going to proceed as long as we can, and then we'll vote, and then we'll come back. So uh, thank you all for being with us this morning. At this time, uh, Ms. Gaffney-Smith, I'd like to recognize you for five minutes for the purpose of an opening statement, and be sure and turn your microphone on. And uh, I guess that little box uh, there on the table, a red light, will come on when the five minutes is up. So you're, you're now recognized. Thank you, sir. Chairman Whitfield and members of the committee, I am Meg Gaffney-Smith, Chief of the Regulatory Program for the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Thank you for the opportunity to discuss the Corps' regulatory authority under Section 404 of the Clean Water Act and Section 10 of the Rivers and Harbors Act related to utility line projects and to discuss our regulatory involvement in the proposed Keystone XL pipeline. Section 10 of the Rivers and Harbors Act requires authorization from the Corps for the construction of any structure, such as the Keystone Pipeline, in, under, or over any navigable water of the U.S. Section 404 of the Clean Water Act requires authorization from the Corps for the discharge of dredged or fill material into waters of the United States. Utility line projects may require 404 permits for temporary fills, such as access roadways, storage and work areas, as well as temporary or permanent impacts associated with grading, bank stabilization, or the crossing itself. When discharges of dredged or fill material are associated with activities of a similar nature and are expected to cause no more than minimal effects, individually or cumulatively, they may be authorized by a general permit. Activities that do not meet the criteria for a general permit are typically processed through the Corps' individual standard permit procedures. When implementing the core regulatory program, the core is neither an opponent or a proponent of any specific project. Our responsibility is to make fair, objective, and timely decisions that protect the aquatic environment and are not contrary to the public interest. The authority to make the final decisions on permit applications rests with our 38 district commanders. Nationwide Permit 12 is a general permit promulgated under Section 404E of the Clean Water Act that may be used to authorize utility line construction. 
The permit authorizes the discharge of dredged and or fill material in association with temporary or permanent activities related to the construction, repair, maintenance, and removal of utility lines, provided the activity does not result in the loss of greater than one-half acre of waters of including wetlands for a single and complete project. Under Nationwide Permit 12, there are seven notification requirements, and if any one of these are triggered, a project proponent must submit a pre-construction notification request to the appropriate core district office before they begin work in waters of the United States. Other statutes impact the ability of the Corps to authorize activities under a nationwide permit. In accordance with the nationwide permit rules and the Endangered Species Act, no activity may be authorized that would be likely to jeopardize the continued existence of threatened or endangered species or destroy or adversely modify the critical habitat of such species. In addition, no activity may be authorized by a nationwide permit until the requirements of Section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act have been fulfilled. Further, the core, the core nationwide permits do not obviate the need to obtain other federal, state, or local permits, approvals, or authorizations that are required by law. In September and October 2011, TransCanada submitted pre-construction notifications to our core districts in Galveston, Fort Worth, and Tulsa, and requested that work in waters of the U.S. in association with the Keystone XL pipeline be verified under Nationwide Permit 12. In November and December, each of the three districts made decisions to exercise their discretionary authority and suspended Nationwide Permit 12 for all work and discharges of dredger fill material into waters of the United States associated with the Keystone XL pipeline application. These decisions were made because of concerns identified by the Department of State that could not be addressed until a final decision was made on the pending presidential permit application. The President has since determined that based on the State Department's view that 60 days is an insufficient period to obtain and assess the necessary information that the Keystone XL pipeline project, as pre presented and analyzed at that time, would not serve the national interest. Should circumstances change in the future, our districts will process any future requests that are submitted for Department of the Army permits in accordance with the appropriate procedures based on our statutory authorities and implementing regulations. If H.R. 3548 is enacted, only the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission and not the Corps would be responsible for issuing any permit required in conjunction with construction, operation, and maintenance of the pipeline. At present, only the Corps has the statutory mandate to review projects like Keystone XL for the permit under the provisions of Section 10 of the Rivers and Harbors Act and Section 404 of the Clean Water Act. However, none of these statutory reviews would be allowed for this project under the language in Section 4A of this bill, and no core permit would be required. I appreciate the opportunity to be here today, and I would be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Gaffney-Smith. Mr. Poole, you are now recognized for five minutes for the purpose of making the opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for inviting the Department of Interior to this hearing on H.R. 3548, the North American Energy Access Act. The legislation directs the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission to approve the Keystone XL pipeline project. The Department has concerns with several provisions of the legislation. The proposed $7 billion pipeline project would spend more than 1,700 miles between Hardesty, Alberta, Canada, and multiple destinations in Oklahoma and Texas. Under Executive Order 13337, all proposed oil pipeline projects that cross the U.S. borders require a presidential permit including a determination that the proposed cross-border pipeline is in the national interest. The State Department reviews applications for a presidential permit and consults with eight other agencies, including the Department of Interior, in its review. The State received an application for Keystone XL project from TransCanada Keystone Pipeline in September of 2008. The proposed 1,700-mile pipeline crosses through eastern Montana for 228 miles, and includes approximately 42 miles of scattered parcels of federal land managed by the BLM. The BLM was a cooperating agency with the State Department, as was the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the National Park Service, in the preparation of an environmental impact statement to address the environmental effects of the proposed pipeline construction and operation activities. The BLM identified pipeline routes across federal lands in Montana that would minimize environmental impacts of pipeline construction. The final EIS was issued on August 26, 2011. 
In addition, under the Mineral Leasing Act, the BLM is authorized to issue rights of ways for crude oil pipelines that cross federal lands. Trans-Canada Keystone Pipeline filed rights of way applications with the BLM in 2008. The Keystone project would include a permanent 50-foot right of way along the scattered 42 miles of BLM managed lands in Montana and comprised a total of 270 acres. Applications were also filed for temporary use permits and for electrical transmission lines on public lands in Montana to supply power to the proposed pumping stations. Temporary rights, temporary rights of ways for construction purposes would comprise a few hundred additional acres dispersed on BLM managed tracts, tracts of land and would be used for a period of three years, then reclaimed by Keystone. These permit applications have not been withdrawn, but processing is on hold. The North American Energy Access, Access, Access Act appears to be, make the Federal Re Energy Regulatory Commission the sole federal agency responsible for the project. The bill would also give the commission sole authority to permit construction, operations, and maintenance for the pipeline and related facilities. The legislation is not clear on how, these pi how the pipeline construction, operation, and maintenance would be carried out on federal lands and what role, if any, the BLM would have with regard to spills on federal lands from the pipeline. This departure from current law would also preclude the BLM from collecting rents and cost recovery related to the pipeline and rights away on federal lands. Thank you for the opportunity to testify before the subcommittee. I am pleased to answer any questions. Uh, Ms. Poole, thank you very much, and at uh, this time I'll recognize myself for five minutes of questions. Uh, there has been a lot of discussion uh, on the Keystone Pipeline about the Koch brothers, and the Koch brothers have indicated that they have no financial, direct financial interest in this pipeline. And for that reason, uh, we've never really called them as a witness, and I might say that we know that the Burlington Northern Santa Fe Railroad has direct r routes right into Canada and Alberta, and that if the pipeline is not built, that maybe some of that oil will move by rail into the U.S. And of course, the owner of that railroad is uh, Warren Buffett, uh, Berkshire Hathaway. Uh, we have not made any effort to call Warren Buffett to testify in this hearing because even though his company might benefit if the pipeline is not built, we do not think he has a direct financial interest in it. And I really, in my view, do not view uh, uh, Warren Buffett and, and the Koch brothers any different on this situation. So I, I simply wanted to mention that. I would also uh, say that the State Department, when it issued its final environmental impact statement in August of 2011, actually made the comment that it would be better to build this pipeline than to not build the pipeline. If you were looking at these two options, it would be better to build it than not to build it. And so uh, other pipeline projects requiring a presidential permit usually take 18 to 24 months to review and approve. Keystone is now in its 40th month. So when these additional delays appeared to be mounting early in 2011, the U.S. House passed bipartisan legislation with 47 Democrats voting yes that simply instructed President Obama to make a final decision one way or the other on the presidential permit by November 1, 2011. At, at the time, the White House stated the legislation was unnecessary because the State Department would be making a decision by the end of 2011. But as President Obama's campaign began to warm up for president, I, the president's political advisors realized that the environmental groups would be uh, quite upset if the president said yes to this pipeline. On the other hand, the labor unions were going to be quite upset, or at least five or six of them, if the president said no to the pipeline. So at that time, the president, instead of making a decision, said that he would wait until after the election to make a decision. So from our perspective, this really was nothing but a political uh, decision. And since we've had 40 months of detailed study and analysis on this, uh, we felt like that there was no reason to delay anymore because we do need to be less dependent upon foreign oil. Uh, we can 
bring in this oil from our friendly neighbor to the north, uh, Canada, and we can create jobs as well. So uh, I want to just make that comment about the Koch brothers and the fact that I don't see that they're in much of a different position than Warren Buffett is, except they're on different sides of the issue, perhaps. And uh, I yield back the balance of my time, and Mr. Rush, I'll recognize you for five minutes for a question. <coughs> Mr. Chairman, I would just suggest, based on your uh, view, that maybe you should invite Warren Buffett and the Koch brothers here. <laughs> That'll be a dandy over here. That would be. <coughs> right. We get a lot of press. Here. Right. Uh, <coughs> I want to ask Mr. Poole, uh, <coughs> Regarding the Bureau of Land Management's current role in permitting process, how was, uh, I think you, you hit on it, but I want you to expound on this. How would this bill affect uh, the role of your agency? How would this bill affect the role of your agency? agency? Um, it, it does raise concerns. Uh, the BLM has a long history of issuing rights of ways in the Mineral Leasing Act, approximately 32,000. Uh, we have the experience, we have the practitioners in the field that are familiar with the, our right-of-way program and the importance of working through NEPA and uh, taking into account any cultural biological concerns. Um, so, it, and we've got that experience, we've dealt with pipelines many times in the past. So the, it, the, the bill, the way it's worded, seems to confer all of our responsibility under the Mineral Leasing Act uh, to FERC. And uh, in some of the accelerated time frames in the bill, um, it, it begs the question whether or not if there's any additional consultation requirements under Section 106 of the National Archaeological Protection Act or any additional consultations may be required to the Fish and Wildlife Service if that's possible. I think the other thing that I think is very important is that BLM has established relationships in the West we have many offices geographically in the West. We are accustomed to working with county, local governments, state governments. We, we work with uh, our federal counterparts as well, as well. So we've been in this process for three years as it relates to our right-of-way, the right-of-way application in Montana. So we have an already established relationship with our federal and state entities as we work through you know, this particular project for future projects. And, um, and I, and I think that, that helps ensure ourselves, inclusive in with the involvement of our federal agencies, that we're fulfilling you know, our congressional mandates. <coughs> Does, uh, <coughs> see your, uh, as far as you, <coughs> excuse me, as far as you're concerned, does FERC have the same vast uh, 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 footprint in, in the West to, Make similar decisions. Well, they don't. I don't. From a jurisdictional ownership standpoint, they do not. They are a regulatory <coughs> entity. I um, mean, to you know, uh, where when it comes to transcontinental natural gas line, FERC usually assumes that lead, and when they're in that role, we are a cooperating agency. But it's important to po point out that uh, you know the more recent example being the Ruby pipeline in the West. They had the lead, but all our other mandates regarding segments that cross public lands or other federal jurisdictions, that was administered and authorized under the Mes Mineral Leasing Act. And all other mandates were also required as well. Mr. Gaffney Smith, uh, the Army Corps of Engineers have a role in uh, this permitting process. And certainly this bill will <coughs> eviscerate some of your responsibilities and some of your uh, long held uh, activities in, in regarding this matter. Would you care to expound so, uh, more on how this bill will affect your role? Our interpretation and understanding of the bill as it's currently proposed would eliminate any um, opportunity for the Corps of Engineers to process any applications related to Section 404 of the Clean Water Act or Section 10 of the Rivers and Harbors Act. And so we would have, under the current language within the bill, we would have no authority to regulate the activities and waters that are under our jurisdiction under those two laws. So this would abrogate your traditional responsibilities uh, and dilute the power and authority and the experience that the Army Corps of Engineers have built up over, over centuries. Yes, okay. it would remove all of our 
our authority and uh, remove any existing experience that we could lend to the review of the proposal. All right. Uh, can either you tell the committee on the provision of this bill which agency or agencies would then be responsible for re enforcing the terms of the environmental impact statement? From the Corps of Engineers' perspective, it looks like the entire responsibility would be provided to the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. Do you agree, Mr. Fuller? That's the way the bill comes across to us as well. And it's a transfer of authority that we currently have in BLM in terms of, uh, you know, issuing the rights ways under the Mineral Releasing Act, and that would be uh, conferred to FERC. Mm -hmm. I think it's also important to point out that in terms of, um, you know, BLM's rights way program, that these are cost reimbursable pr programs for, so the work that we perform, the studies that may be necessary depending on where any pipeline may be run right across public land, industry provides a cost reimbursable account. So that account would, under this bill, would pretty much, you know, uh, we would not have it anymore. We would be out of the picture. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. At this time, I recognize the gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Sullivan, uh, for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Whitfield. <clears throat> During his State of the Union address, President Obama turned his back on the Keystone Pipeline. He actually rejected the advice of his own jobs council who recommended an all-in all approach to energy policy that included expediting energy projects like pipelines. Like many Americans, I was surprised at the primary reason the President stated for his denial, saying Congress forced this decision with an arbitrary deadline. If excuses were barrels of oil, this administration would have filled our strategic petroleum reserves several times over. The truth of the matter is, the administration had three years to reach a decision on Keystone XL, but failed to do so. If more than 1,100 days is not enough time, then exactly how much time do you need to secure our energy future, Mr. President? This begs the question of just who is in control of our national, nation's energy agenda. Time and time again, we hear about President Obama's commitment to American-made energy that creates jobs and, re and reduces our dependence on foreign oil yet he rejects a no-brainer like Keystone XL. The truth is he made a calculated political decision to reject it to keep his anti-jobs environmental base happy in an election year. By rejecting the pipeline, President Obama turned his back on American jobs. What logical reason could there be to say no to 20,000 new private sector jobs and potentially 100,000 indirect jobs while our nation's unemployment rate remains above 8 percent. It is in both our economic and national security interest to use the oil and gas reserves right here in our own backyard. Mr. President, why not embrace, uh, embrace bol or why not embrace bolstering our energy supply with a stable source of oil from Canada and North Dakota instead of politically tumultuous OPEC nations? Unlike the trillion dollar failed stimulus law, the Keystone Project is privately funded and does not cost the taxpayers one dime. The Keystone XL pipeline is a game changer for energy security. The pipeline, when fully complete, would transport nearly 1.3 million barrels of oil per day from Alberta and North Dakota to refineries in the Midwest and Gulf Coast. I believe this is in our national interest to move forward with this pipeline and the State Department's three-year delay is considering and considering this pipeline is a national travesty. Three years into the Obama presidency, he has severely limited access to both on and offshore oil and gas reserves, pushed the most expensive environmental regulatory agenda in history, and sent a half billion dollars of taxpayer money to Solyndra, a now bankrupt solar company. The fact of the matter is that our country needs an all, all the energy we can get to continue growing our economy. With gas prices expected to rise in the coming months, his decision to reject the Keystone Pipeline means that our energy security is now in the hands of China, Iran, and other OPEC nations. Not a good choice. Mis Mr. Chairman, the Keystone Pipeline is the right thing to do to create jobs and make our nation more energy secure. And I'd like to yield the balance of my time to Congressman Lee Terry from Nebraska. If the gentleman doesn't mind, can I reject that since I only have a minute 30 left? Yes, you can. But I appreciate that opportunity. Yes, sir. 
The gentleman yields back his time. This time, I recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. Waxman, for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, the topic that we're discussing is the Keystone Pipeline. But I must say the Republicans are like Keystone cops in the way they've handled this whole issue. They have been going way out on a limb to get this pipeline approved, even to the point where a tax cut for middle class and Americans and unemployment benefits and money for physicians was a bill was held up to make sure that there was a provision to give special treatment to the Keystone Pipeline. But these brilliant people put in a provision that said the President had to decide the issue within a certain period of time. They forgot to tell him how he had to decide it. And the President said, I want to get all the facts first. And I'm not going to approve it in this time frame. So now they've come up with a bill. This is a remarkable bill. This bill says, and I wish people would read it. This, it says, this is a, this, the pipeline in this bill is the Keystone XL pipeline, no question about it. And they are exempted from review except for 30 days. But if the, the FERC doesn't give them a permit in 30 days, then it will be deemed approved. They're not taking any chances now. And in addition, they say that the two other agencies and all the other agencies that might be involved in reviewing this bill will no longer have the power to review the bill. So we have witnesses here from two of the agencies that ordinarily would review any legislation, not legislation, any, any application for something that would go over public lands, over waterways. Suddenly they're out. They can't review it. So when we found out, when Mr. Terry found out that was the case, he just said to us for the first time this morning, oh, we're not going to do that. We're going to put them back in the bill. So the application has to be pre-approved in 30 days or it's approved. If they want to make a modification, they could ask for a review for 30 days, but if it's not approved in 30 days, it's approved. For this one project, now we wanted to find out what interest the Coke industries had. Now, why did we want to find that out? Well, the Coke Industries is one of the largest crude oil exporters in Canada. The Coke Industries own the terminal in Canada where the pipeline would begin. The Coke Industries has a refinery near where the pipeline would end. And the chairman said they, he'd take their word for it. They don't have any interest, even though there's evidence to the contrary. But then he throws out a real herring, as no one better than a Keystone cop could do. And his argument, oh, well, wait a minute. There's another guy who agrees with the Democrats some of the time who owns a railroad. And they might put the coal tar sands on a railroad. So really what the Democrats are doing is fronting for another industry. Boy, does that make sense. You got the crude oil owner with the pipeline and the refinery, and we should just take their word for they have no interest, but we should then point the figure at Warren Buffett's company. And then what do they do? They say in hearings, well, we know what's going on. We're attributing the worst possible motives to the President of the United States. It's all political. Well, that's quite a statement. How do they get into the President's head? What the President said is, I want to get information before I approve it. And they say, aha. What is really going on is the president is trying to take care of the environmentalists, and he's going to annoy them. They've got it all written out. They could be on 24-hour news radio. They figured it all out without getting more information. Well, we have two witnesses right now. And before acting, we should get uh, some further information about this special interest bill. It directs the FERC to deal with the matter, but Ms. Gaffney-Smith, under the Section 404 of the Clean Water Act, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers has a permitting process to ensure that wetlands are protected from discharges of dredged or filled material. Now, doesn't this bill take away jurisdiction of your agency over this pipeline? It appears to do so, yes. And Mr. Um, Poole, uh, the, um, your, your agency has to do with uh, uh, wildlife, uh, tell me what your agency would ordinarily review and whether you have that ability to review it. 
Yeah, uh, Congressman, we, all these type actions, we review them for our land use plans. That's the congressional mandate under FLIPMA. And are you being taken, is that jurisdiction being taken away from you? It appears it would, that we would no longer apply those other congressional We mandates. used to have a party in this country called the Know Nothings. And the people that are pushing this bill want us to know nothing about this pipeline except what the proponents want us to know. And if the Koch brothers are proponents and are going to benefit, I'd like to know about it and the American people ought to know about it as well. My time has expired, and I hope we have another round. This time, I recognize the gentleman from Oregon, uh, Mr. Walden, for five minutes. Well, I thank the gentleman uh, very much. Mr. Poole, uh, tell me again the agency you're with. Bureau of Land Management. And tell me uh, how many acres are at play uh, and, and uh, uh, that you've reviewed as, as part of the Keystone Pipeline review process? Congressman, the majority of that acreage is in Montana. Yes, sir. About a little over 42-mile segment, and it comprises, given the linear width, 50 feet, it comprises about 250 acres, with an additional 900 acres that would be needed probably for staging uh, during the construction phase. Yeah, I, I was thinking, I, I was looking for it here in your, your testimony. I, I, I thought it was actually 270 acres is what your testimony is, but yeah. it's the same, 250, yeah. 270. And you've done the environmental uh, work on that, right, the review process through NEPA already? Our segment was reviewed through yes, the NEPA sir. process that was led by the State Department. Right. Um, and so, you know, the segment that we're associated with through our mandates was evaluated and as a result of the final EIS that came out in August, we didn't identify any major constraints to that segment in terms of pipeline authorization. So you've done the full review. You've been through the, 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 the EIS, the SEIS, the uh, uh, final environmental impact statement. And, and this is all about a 50-foot wide swath that covers 278. Now, the other land uh, that you talked about that, did you say 900, roughly 900 acres? It's, it used, you know, what we, we this issue. This is temporary in and out. It is. It's, um, you know, temporary use permits or grants to facilitate uh, staging during the construction phase. And then and that would revert back. It would. That's for a three-year period. Okay. And then uh, talk to me about any issues related to uh, the work that your, your fine agency did on the biological opinions related to the Endangered Species Act. <coughs> did you find any, any threat to uh, threatened or endangered species? Um, I think the initial biological opinion that was um, provided uh, indicated uh, there would not likely be a jeopardy to the existence of threatened endangered species. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, it was subsequently withdrawn. And, um, but it was a FEIS as well, right? I mean, it had gone through the full... It, it, it's correct. It was issued after um, the issuance of the FEIS. Right. So, so you, your agency, your biologists, all the people that do this work have thoroughly reviewed the Keystone part that would cross federal land over which you have jurisdiction. That is correct. And found no, not, no likely jeopardy uh, of any threatened or endangered species. And you're talking about a total of 270 acres roughly for the, the full pipeline. Correct. So the State Department had on, all that information. On yes, they do. Yeah. On the public lands. Yeah. yeah. We, Which we're a cooperator to the State Department, one of many. So, right. Um, but that's the, that's, the, uh, that's the area that we're responsible for as it crosses public land. All right. Good. I think we've got a sliver, mile, mile and a half in South Dakota, but the majority of that crossing on public land occurs in Montana. All right. All right. I appreciate that. I think that's important for the record because we've heard a lot of spin up rhetoric here and I, I just want to get to the facts. I, I went through some of the FEIS in the last hearing we had and uh, you know the w we hear about this jobs number. It gets batted all over. You know, I, I think we'd want private sector investment and this is seven billion I believe in, in shovel ready private sector construction jobs. And there are estimates of twenty thousand. Now I, I think what Mr. Waxman referenced was actually only the construction jobs during the phase of the construction but, but I know, having been a, a small business owner for more than two decades, that w when you uh, get involved in a big project, it's not, I mean, we were just in the radio business, but, you know, if I bought a transmitter, somebody had to build that thing, and I had to hire an engineer to install it, and I had to go through a lot of other efforts. So there were a lot of other indirect jobs associated, and I think that's maybe where the difference of opinion here is on the jobs. If you only look at just exactly the, you know, 
several thousands of jobs that would be there for two years in an industry that's been devastated over the last three years, um, I, I'd, I'd take whatever jobs we could. And if, if there's no environmental impact on the federal lands, and it doesn't appear there would be, um, I think we can make the change Mr. Mr. Terry recommended uh, to deal with the issue that, that Ms. Gaffney Smith, that if we change this bill uh, to uh, allow you to continue to have your statutory authority, uh, that wouldn't be a problem, would it? No, we'd evaluate all the crossings and the impacts under the current authorities, statutory authorities in our regulations. And have you done that already? No, we haven't done it. We've only received uh, pre-construction notifications for certain aspects of the pipeline. I see. My time's expired. Thank you very much. It's time to recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Gonzalez, for five minutes. <coughs> Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, and welcome uh, to the witnesses. And we had a witness from FERC that it, the way I recall his testimony was, one, they weren't really equipped to do it. Two, the timeline that's being imposed by this particular bill, 3548, uh, was not realistic. And I believe uh, what you provide and what you bring to the equation of building this pipeline safely is invaluable and essential, and I don't believe that this bill uh, is the best method of accomplishing the building out of the Keystone Pipeline, which I support. I just don't think this is the way to do it. My greater fear, and we're going to have some other witnesses that may address some other implications, and that is unrealistic expectations of what this pipeline is going to provide this country. I'm going to do this as briefly as I can. First of all, when it comes to price, fuel prices reduces economic growth at a very, very sensitive time in this country. High gas prices reduced economic growth in this country in 2012 by 0.5 percent, when we know that total growth for the year, we're looking at around 2 percent. So it was substantial. I do not believe that the Keystone Pipeline will reduce fuel prices, and that's what we're telling the American public, and we keep going on. I wish we had a hearing that would really explore the impact on price, because eventually it will be our constituents that will be dumbfounded when we complete the pipeline and they're still paying an extraordinary amount of money for a gallon of gasoline. Um, gasoline supplies are being exported to the highest bidder. I said this last week. Uh, leading all exports in this country was fuel last year. So it is a global market. That's what we're in competition with. Um, and this is from uh, Tom Close, a chief oil analyst at Oil Price Information Service, which he said it is a world market and will go to the highest bidder. At a Senate hearing, the president of Shell back in May of last year said, simply stated, oil is a global commodity, and oil companies are price takers, not price makers. That is the same lesson that is going to be imposed on refiners. It is a global market. So who owns all the oil that is coming and is going to be stored somewhere? Well, that's really curious, and maybe we can understand global markets and how the prices are arrived at. This is a story in the Dallas Morning News, 15th of May last year. Some 70 percent of contracts for future oil delivery are now bought by financial speculators, largely big investment banks and hedge funds, who never take control of the oil. They just flip the contract for a quick profit. Only about 30 percent of oil contracts are bought by a purchaser that actually intends to use the oil, such as an airline. That's according to the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, which regulates trade in those contracts. Michael McMaster's Wall Street investor testified before Congress repeatedly that speculators are pushing prices well beyond what the supply and the demand warrant. Uh, and then I want to end this with by. Uh, until the early 1990s, the ratio of speculative trades to trades made by commercial users of oil was tilted heavily towards the users of oil. But from 1991 forward, the big financial players such as Goldman Sachs and J.P. Morgan won exemptions that freed them from limits on how much they could speculate in future markets. Now, we've attempted to do something about that, but the majority party has fought us tooth and nail on this, whether it's Dodd-Frank or anything else that addresses some sort of a regulatory scheme that will now allow 
the playing of futures and commodities to the detriment of the American consumers. This is all part of it, but we seem to be ignoring a holistic approach. Now, what really concerns me is we're going to have a witness that's going to tell us that this may not be the answer to national security. Now, I think that it can be, depending on how we use the raw product and the refined product that we derive from oil. But if, in fact, it is a global market, the only way you maintain that edge is somehow making sure that there is available, accessible, and affordable supply in the United States. But if you have investors that are charged with the fiduciary duty of making a good profit for their investors, and that is the American way, and I have no problem with that, what do you do? Do you keep it in the domestic market, or do you export it? So it's not just about the safety of the pipeline. I believe that I'd rather be dependent on Mexico and Canada than Saudi Arabia and Venezuela. Uh, I mean, there is no doubt about that, or Venezuela. But the problem we have is not a realistic approach, and I guess that's what really concerns me. And I'm hoping to return for the witnesses that are going to be touching on some of the subject matter that I just touched on. I appreciate your testimony today. I think you are invaluable to this whole equation of building a safe Keystone Pipeline. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This time, I recognize the gentleman, uh, Mr. Terry. From the Thank you, and uh, I guess I'm one likes to submit items for the uh, record. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, I ask unanimous consent that I may submit for the record a memorandum uh, from the U.S. State Department, uh, Mr. Keith Bennis, dated June 22, 2011. And uh, on uh, the issue that my friend from St. Louis, St. Louis, San Antonio, a little further south, uh, mentioned, uh, it is the, on the record from the State Department's review of this pipeline uh, that uh, eliminating transportation constraints from Cushing to Houston would not adversely affect uh, Midwest gasoline consumers. In fact, it goes on and says that it would uh, help crude prices decline, uh, considering that the transportation is consistent, reliable, and less expensive. Let's keep in mind uh, that what we're talking about is, is around 700,000 barrels initially going up to a million barrels that would completely offset the need for us to send tankers to Venezuela and fill up with their heavy crude and ship it up here. Um, it so defies we, we, logic. I might just say without objection that. that Thank you, and I right. submit that, so I'll put it up here. But it simply defies logic to me uh, that when you have a transportation system that the State Department even testified was safer the safest means of transport, the most environmentally safe uh, transport, uh, that there'd be arguments that it, it would not add to our energy security. Uh, and then secondly, on the jobs, you know, it, it befuddles most Americans, uh, as polling has shown, that this president denied the permit and the jobs that would be created, if you look into the uh, union hall at the, for the laborers or the IBEW, there's people sitting on the bench waiting to uh, have their names on the list to be called that when this starts, they go to work. Right now in Nebraska, there's an engineering company that uh, has ceased doing work because of the denial of this permit on the Nebraska route. Um, and yeah, it befuddles me and most of Americans when my friends on the other side of the aisle say that, geez, uh, 6,000 direct jobs out on the pipeline is not enough for them. And by the way, it's only temporary. Well, I don't know an infrastructure project that isn't temporary, so evidently we're against all infrastructure now. Uh, it just it, it befuddles me uh, why they would oppose it. now. Uh, Ms. Um, Gaffney Smith, uh, I appreciate your testimony here today and with the help of the State Department, uh, you've made some valid points that we, we realized and have uh, decided before this hearing today, even after last week, 
that we needed to make sure that we are clear in the fact that the intent of this bill was the presidential uh, authority needed to be moved away from the White House uh, to an agency uh, that had expertise in pipelines to, to make a decision on whether it's safety or and soundness of a pipeline versus uh, the politics that seemed to have overwhelmed this uh, issue. Now, with that, uh, making that correction that recognizes that we aren't usurping the Corps of Engineers' powers, uh, we want you to make that review. Do you have any objections to this legislation? I can't speak to legislation where I haven't seen the actual language, but it would be it would be appropriate, I think, for us to look at that and see if it, in Can fact, puts why? puts us back. Your microphone. I'm not aware that an official invitation was, was provided. Let me ask you, Mr. Poole. Uh, in the state of Nebraska, thank you. I hear it now. In the state of Nebraska, uh, what federal lands did the original route take? Or uh, would the original route go through any federal lands? Yes, Congressman. Uh, there was a small piece of uh, land administered by DOR, Bureau of Reclamation, had to do with the canal area that we would have had. That was South Dakota, wasn't it? No, that's Nebraska. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so... All right. My time is up. I'm sorry. I'll have to get... I'll submit that one for the record for you to get back to me on it. Will do. Yeah. At this time, I recognize the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Dingle, for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, I thank you for your courtesy. I'd like to make a couple of quick observations. In 1970, Scoop Jackson and I wrote the National Environmental Policy Act. It was to depoliticize the approval of projects and to see to it that we had the information we needed when we were going into those kinds of questions. So it required an environmental impact statement. That can be speeded up and properly so. But I, I would caution that if you speed it up too fast, you're going to repoliticize this and make a fine mess out of the thing and cause no end of trouble and litigation. So I would beg you not to do this. I say that, uh, parenthetically, I want to support this legislation. I think that the Canadians are going to do this, whether we like it or not. And they're either going to build a pipeline going west or going south. And it's better, in my view, that if that pipeline goes anywhere, it goes south to the United States because it'll be a much more dependable source of energy for the United States. So I would urge my colleagues not to drive away members like me by moving too fast on this, because if you do, you'll just simply create a wealth of litigation. The lawyers will have a fine time, make lots of money, and the business of the country will be, in fact, delayed by carelessness in this committee. Having said that, um, first question here to Mr. Poole. Uh, did State Department refer the application to your department or to the BLM, yes or no? Say again, sir. Did the State Department refer the application to your department or to the BLM, which? The, well, the, the application that we received was from the applicant for the segment of public land that was coming across Montana. That's a right-of-way application. Now, Ms. Gaffney-Smith, did the State Department refer the application to the Corps? No. Like the Department of Interior, the application came from the applicant. Okay. Did, BLM, did BLM provide views on the permit application? Answer yes or no. Provide what, sir? Did BLM provide views on the permit application? Please answer yes or no. The, we were part of the environmental... Uh, impact process that was led by the uh, State Department okay. and so uh, the mandates that we uh, have obligations with in terms of issuing a right-of-way grant in Montana, then we did review the application uh, in the context of the overall NEPA product. Now, Ms. Gaffney-Smith, did the Corps provide views on the permit application? 
in, in three core districts in Galveston, Fort Worth, and Tulsa District, we received a pre-construction notification for Nationwide Permit 12. We initiated coordination with other agencies, and we, we did provide a response to the applicant in accordance with our Nationwide Permit rules based on comments we received from the Department of State. So the answer is yes? Yes. Under H.R. 3548, environmental review process would need to be completed within 30 days. Uh, even though BLM would no longer be involved in the permit review process under this bill, is 30 days enough time for BLM to do the necessary due, due diligence on submitting its views for the Keystone Pipeline? Yes or no? Congress, I would say no, it's not enough Very time. Very good. Uh, Ms. Gaffney-Smith, the same question to you. Is 30 days enough time for the Corps to submit its views? No, I don't believe so. Um, do you believe, th this goes uh, to, to both, uh, yes or no. Uh, do you believe that FERC has the experience that BLM has to review a permit of this scope? Please answer yes or no. I don't believe they do. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Ma'am? No, sir. Uh, now, Ms. Gaffney-Smith, uh, do you believe that FERC has the experience that the Corps has to review a permit of this scope? That's practically the same question as the prior one, but it's a little more subtle. Yes or no? No. Now, uh, and I want to thank you and apologize for the fact that I've curtailed you in your time. Mr. Chairman, we can hurry this process in a way which is going to create lots of trouble and wind up ultimately with a delay or veto or profound litigation that can go on for years. If that occurs, we will then find ourselves in the splendid position of having to re-enter this issue with all of the politics that goes to it and all the difficulty, or we can begin moving to try and work this thing out. I would like to move in that direction. I hope the committee will will exceed to that kind of view and we can begin working on this in, in that way rather than getting ourselves in a splendid fight which will generate monstrous ill will and create a situation where there will actually be more delay rather than less. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Mr. Dingell. Uh, w we do have uh, votes on the floor, but we Thank do you. have about six minutes left. so. Uh, Ms. Capps, I believe you are here, so I recognize you for a period of five minutes. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and because I know Mr. Markey also uh, was here and wants to speak, I'm asking Mr. Markey, do you want some of my time? Uh, would you like some of my time? Or maybe it's not. Okay, I'll, I'll, start, I'll do it. I'm, um, uh, I come from an area that is energy producing as well, and I... Uh, I'm very uh, impressed with, uh, I have one image in my mind because it was you, Mr. Poole, when you, when you uh, were in charge of the BLM and for the state of California, and I was newly elected, who escorted me for the first time to see what we call the, the Shangri-La of the West, the Carrizo Plain, eastern portion of San Luis Obispo County, fragile ecosystem that is a remnant of the way the land was 300 years ago, in which the all of the vested interest, the, the mineral rights, the cattle ranchers, and all of the stakeholders have found a way to preserve the natural history under the leadership of the BLM and also make that an economically viable area. Um, oil and gas industry have all take, had their role there. And I picture this pipeline going through the Carrizo Plain, and I'm very concerned that we take the time that's needed to preserve in the Midwest uh, what I know from my area to be in the possibility of protecting the land as well as furthering economic interest. And I see this latest attempt by House Republicans to short circuit the review process. And I want to ask uh, you, uh, f because I know your expertise, Mr. Poole, and I also have a number of Army Corps projects in my district as well and have had the pleasure of working with that agency. Mr. Poole, would it make sense for the Bureau of Land Management or the Fish and Wildlife Service to issue permits for a pipeline with an unknown route? 
which is what we have before us today. Um, Congresswoman, I can only speak to the segment in Montana that uh, we are knowledge, knowledgeable of that area and the application is very precise as to where it right. will be located. And but uh, now for the further part of it, you, you have no knowledge exactly of where the preciseness, about the preciseness, is that correct? N generally speaking, we do on a map. I mean, we see the whole delineation of the pipeline from north to south, but uh, if it doesn't fall within public land jurisdiction, then it's not going to pertain to BLM. Okay. Dar would you like to respond, and then I want to turn to my colleague. Can you repeat the question, please? Just does it make sense for the, uh, does the Army Corps of Engineers typically provide permits for pipeline projects when the route of the pipeline is unknown? No, we only evaluate permits for applications that have su been submitted by project applicants that have a, a project. And now I would like to yield the balance of my time to Mr. Markey. Mike. Okay. I, thank, I thank the gentlelady. Um, under this bill, are there any guarantees that all of the friendly Canadian oil that is sent through the pipeline will be sold here in the United States? No. No. So let me get this plan right. Step one. TransCanada puts the dirtiest oil on the planet into the brand new pipeline that the Republicans are giving it. Step two, TransCanada sends that oil to the Gulf Coast where they can make billions more than where they currently sell it in the Midwest. Step three, refineries in the Gulf Coast re-export it to other countries at world oil prices and don't pay any taxes for doing it. Step four, Americans get higher gas prices and no increased energy security. And step five, TransCanada and the sheiks in Saudi Arabia laugh all the way to the bank. That's pretty much what this bill allows. Make no mistake, this bill is not about energy security. It's not about jobs. It is about oil company profits, plain and simple. This bill just turns the United States into a middleman in a multinational oil deal between Canada, South America, Europe, or China. The Republican slogan last year was drill here, drill now, pay less. Now we're letting Canada drill here, ship here, and re-export. So all we have to do is pay more, both in terms of money at the gas pump and cost to the environment. Today, I, along with Mr. Waxman and Congressman Cohen and Connolly and Welsh will introduce a bill to require that if this pipeline is permitted, the oil will stay here to benefit Americans. If we are going to go to the extreme lengths of legislating the construction of an environmentally destructive pipeline to benefit a Canadian company, we should at least be sure that we in the United States can realize the energy security and consumer benefits that we've been told the project will bring. Let's play it straight about the Straits of Hormuz. Without my bill, this pipeline will not do a thing to enhance the security of our country or of our brave men and women stationed all over the world for purposes of protecting our fossil fuel interests. We need a bill, if it does pass, that guarantees the oil from this pipeline stays here in the United States. The CEO of TransCanada sat right there and said he would not support that legislation. That's all we have to know about our relationship with this TransCanada company. This oil is to be exported around the world, not to keep prices lower here in the United States. I yield back the balance of my time, Mr. Chairman. I might say that uh, of all the U.S. petroleum products today, we're currently exporting <coughs> less than 5 percent. At this time, uh, the number one export for the United States in 2011 was oil petroleum products. That was the number one export of Which all products in the United we States. We want to increase our exports and get not our of oil, down. not of oil. That's uh, our security. Uh, all the members are gone. We still have a vote on the floor, uh, so I'm going to release uh, this panel. Ms. Gaffney Smith, thank you for being here. Mr. Poole, thank you for being here. We'll recess for about. I would say 35 or 40 minutes, and then we'll come back and we'll uh, begin with panel two. Thank you. We're in recess.
I'll call the hearing uh, back to order. And before I introduce the witnesses, I, uh, as we were finishing up with the first panel, there was a lot of back and forth about whether or not we were going to release the first panel. And uh, in consultation with the majority, a decision was made to release them. But I had already told Mr. Bilbray before he left that he could come back and ask them questions. And since they're not here, I am going to recognize Mr. Bilbray for three minutes to uh, say whatever he wanted to say about the Corps of Engineers or whatever the issue was. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Mr. Chairman, I appreciate you giving me the time. It is frustrating that you, you know, think you have an agreement. And I think some of these questions are important, but I will raise them even with the Army Corps here because I've got a little experience in 404 permit. I was actually cited or give, given my Miranda rights um, for a potential violation of the 404 permit because I was involved in damming up sewage coming in from Mexico and they constituted a sewage break as possible na um, navigable water. So it, it, it is very near and dear. Also, Mr. Chairman, there's a lot of talk here in, in Washington, D.C. about certain jobs, uh, aggressive job programs by the federal government. And uh, the Tennessee Authority was one of them that's been cited again and again. And I'd like to point out to everybody that the Tennessee Authority, though it crossed thousands of so-called navigable waterways, never received one 404 permit because there was no such thing as a 404 permit there. So when we talk about all of these great job programs as ways of stimulating the economy that were in the past, we've got to remember just how much regulatory um, oversight and regulatory obstructionism de facto has occurred um, since then, that there are things that we've done in the past that would not be legal to do under today's regulations, and we need to address that. The other issue I wanted to raise was the fact that though it takes a 404 permit to build a, a put a pipeline over a navigable waterway to transport oil, there is no 404 permit required to transport the same oil by truck over a bridge that spans a navigable waterway. The same way there is no requirement for a 404 permit for a train to go across a bridge that spans a, a, um, a navigable waterway, even though statistically the risk of having spills caused by truck and train transport into those navigable waterways is much higher. There's also the issue of the fact that no one talks about is they look at the risk of the pipeline, but don't look at the no project option risk that if you transport the same oil, that 1,700 miles, it is 87 times more dangerous to human life uh, uh, that an accident would occur than with transport by oil. So as when we get into these issues, as somebody has worked in environmental agencies, have had the privilege of being a regulator, I think the, no, the environmental impact of the no project option is one that any reasonable person who really cares about the environment has to understand. And the fact that the State Department has admitted that the transport of this oil by alternative sources on the same route or in any route related to it would be many times more polluting than the use of a pipeline. I am shocked that the same State Department, though, cannot quantify how many metric tons a year would be emitted by going to those other alternative site, um, uh, transports, the, the pipe, uh, the truck, and the train. I mean, coming from California and working on the Air Resources Board, we would tell you down to the down to the minute of what it is because we, we use good science to make those decisions. The State Department admits that the air pollution impacts for transport by the alternatives are higher than the transport of this pipeline. So I think in all fairness, the, no, the, the adverse environmental impact of the no project option has not be, been given a fair hearing, has not been identified and, and, and quantified in a responsible way. And before you start turning down these projects, you've got to look at what is going to be the impact of the environment before you do that. And let me just close. One of the things I'm really concerned about is that Canada is being treated like we can't trust Canada with their environment. I think their history on environmental issues is something that really puts into question why we approved this, uh, many crossings to Mexico and we are holding up this one to Canada. And I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Bilbright. At this time, I'd like to- Chairman. Yes, sir. I understand Mr. Engel would like to have his three minutes on our side as well. Sure. And I hope he can be recognized. Ab absolutely. Mr. Engel, you recognize three minutes. Gentlemen, uh, yield to me. Uh, yes. Yes. I, I, I'll, I'll yield to the, uh, the, the chair. I, I thank you for yielding because this last statement by my colleague from California made no sense to me. 
He's criticizing the different alternatives of bringing these tar sands down from Canada and saying if it's done by railroad as opposed to pipeline. The real issue is whether they're going to do these tar sands at all. Because if they can't bring it into the United States, they're not going to develop those tar sands. And in developing those tar sands, which is the dirtiest source of coal, they have to spend so much energy to refine it sufficiently sure. to have it go through a pipeline and maybe on a train. Bec at some point, it's going to have to be refined. And the en in energy used to refine it adds to the greenhouse gases. So I just want people to understand there's not just a question of how it's going to be transported. If it's going to be transported, a pipeline is a way we often use to transport these things. We have pipelines, by the way. We're not against pipelines. But any pipeline ought to be reviewed by the appropriate agencies. And the two witnesses we had on the first panel mm -hmm. were going to be taken out of their opportunity to review any proposal. And of course, this bill isn't about pipelines. It's only about one specific pipeline that's going to be given a treatment that no other pipeline has had. And that's Nobody reviews it. If they review it, they have 30 days, and they've got to come up with the right conclusion. That is a special interest bill, an earmark for this one project, and it's uh, really troubling because we've had, we're going to be added, adding to the greenhouse gases, which not just affects Canada but the whole world, at a time when we ought to be reducing greenhouse gases. We're going to be committed to that source of energy. Uh, where we ought to be looking for other ways to uh, use less energy and make us more independent. I think uh, our witnesses on the second panel have more to say about that issue. I, I, I thank the gentleman for yielding part of his time to me. I'd like to uh, reclaim my time and say, you know, I, I have an open mind in, in general about the whole issue of, of Keystone. Um, but I have, um, I, I'm, I'm very concerned about this. Um, removing all federal review of all agencies except FERC, and then mandating that FERC issues the permit, uh, to me, it doesn't sound like we are really weighing the pros and cons. We're, we're, we're rushing to make a decision on one side. Um, the health and safety of the American people uh, is, is paramount. And if we're not going to take that seriously, it, it really troubles me. The other thing that troubles me is that I have, you know, I would feel much more comfortable if I knew that the oil that was coming down uh, to be refined from Canada, uh, to be refined uh, in Texas, went for uh, domestic consumption in the United States, um, I've sat through hearings that this committee has had, and I'm still not satisfied or convinced that that oil isn't going to get shipped to China or some other place. So those are some of the questions that I have about this. Mr. Thank Chairman, you. just for the record, I misstated. I, I said the word coal. I didn't mean coal. I meant oil. This is the dirtiest source of oil from these uh, tar sands, and that's what I meant to uh, say. I'm glad you stated. were not talking about coal. Shh. No, we're not. I wouldn't want to take you on on that issue. At this time, I would like to introduce the panel, the second panel. We have with us uh, retired Brigadier General Stephen Anderson, the United States Army, who's originally from California, and we have Mr. Randall Thompson, who is a rancher in Nebraska, and <coughs> we uh, welcome you to the hearing. We appreciate your being here very much. And at this time, uh, General Anderson, I'll recognize you for your five-minute opening statement. And I think that a little box on the table there, a red light will come on when the five minutes is up. So uh, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm Steve Anderson, a concerned citizen and part owner of a service-disabled veteran-owned small business based in Knoxville, Tennessee. I'd like to begin by thanking the subcommittee for this opportunity, as well as thanking my president for the courageous decision he made to deny the Keystone XL pipeline. Frankly, as a political con conservative and a longtime registered Republican, I don't often agree with President Obama, but on this matter, he absolutely got it right. I strongly oppose the Keystone XL pipeline because it will degrade our national security. The critical element is simply this. The pipeline keeps our great nation addicted to oil, a dependence that makes us both strategically and operationally vulnerable. As a retired general officer with over 31 years of service, I believe that I'm fully qualified to comment on both of these vulnerabilities. The pipeline will keep us dependent upon outside sources to meet most of our energy needs. In reality, Keystone only addresses a symptom of our illness, the source of our oil. 
It does nothing to cure the disease itself, which is our over-reliance on oil. And as nations like China and India continue to demand more oil themselves, competition will increase, and such international tension threatens our security and stability that we enjoy today. Additionally, continued carbon-based energy consumption drives CO2 emissions that will lead to climate change and increasingly catastrophic weather events. The potential instability puts us all at risk. Furthermore, the pipeline keeps us strategically vulnerable because our economy will remain petrocentric. And many thousands of companies developing clean energy technologies and providing renewable energy solutions won't grow capacity and capability as quickly as America needs. I believe, I believe Keystone will set back the alternative energy industry in this country 20 years. Now, two weeks ago, I read that Dubai will invest $2.7 billion in solar energy next year. Now, Dubai is an emirate surrounded by the world's largest oil fields. Their economy is 250 times smaller than ours. Yet they are astute enough to see the consequences of an oil-dependent economy and are willing to invest now in renewable energy in a big way. Why aren't we? And because we are not fully committed to developing renewable energy capabilities, our soldiers in harm's way are operationally vulnerable too. Serving for 15 months as General Petraeus, a senior logistician in Iraq, I struggled with the challenge of providing 3 million gallons of JP-8 fuel every day to sustain our forces. I saw the huge impact of not having any renewable energy systems and being completely dependent upon oil-based power generation. In consideration of the fully burdened cost of fuel in the, in the combat zone, taxpayers have been spending well over $30 billion annually for our fuel needs. That's with a B, billion. And now that Pakistan has cut off our access to Afghanistan, it'll be even higher this year. But the dollar cost doesn't concern me near as much as the human cost. Over 1,000 American troops have been killed during the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan executing fuel missions. We should all be outraged by this loss of life. And to make matters worse, our oil addiction is empowering our enemy. Our long supply lines provide thousands of convenient targets and the revenues from satiating our oil habit bring the enemy the resources they use to kill us. Imagine the benefits of our military if they were fighting a much, much less capable enemy. Imagine leveraging solar, wind, and geothermal technologies to end the war sooner, to save billions of dollars and soldier lives. Now allow me also to comment on the jobs issue associated with this pipeline. As a former soldier, I'm extremely concerned of the high unemployment rates for our vets. Of course I want more unemployment opportunities for my brethren, but they need jobs with staying power. They need careers. America is best served by an economic climate that generates jobs for vets for 100 years, not 100 days. And every job that the pipeline produces, a clean energy economy could produce 1,000. Bottom line, the pipeline feeds an addiction that makes us less secure and enables our enemies. Now is the time to make the hard choices and deal with this disease head on and put our future economic prosperity in the capable hands of middle America rather than big oil. I stand before you today absolutely convinced that the national mission and focus that put a man on the moon 42 years ago can once again prevail. Stopping this pipeline today will help set the conditions needed such that our innate American will to win and entrepreneurial drive will succeed in breaking our terrible addiction to oil. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, General Anderson. Uh, Mr. Thompson, you're recognized for five minutes for your opening statement. Turn that on. Yep, there you, go. you can tell I'm used to testifying in Congress. Um, my name is Randy Thompson. I am from Martell, Nebraska. I'm here as a Nebraska citizen and landowner. I'd like to thank the chairman and the committee for the opportunity to be here today. I'd like to start my testimony today by thanking President Obama for making the right decision by denying the permit for the Keystone XL pipeline. I'm proud to think that the voices of Nebraskans had an impact on his decision. 
Those of us who live and work along the proposed path of this pipeline applaud him for placing our welfare ahead of the interests of big oil companies. As a lifelong Nebraskan, I can honestly tell you that I have never witnessed any project that has stirred the emotions of my fellow Nebraskans like the Keystone XL has. Contrary to what you may have heard from some of our elected officials, I can assure you that the dust has not settled in Nebraska on this issue. TransCanada has built a mountain of distrust among the ordinary citizens of our state. And even with their voluntary agreement to move the pipeline out of the sand hills, we remain very skeptical. Many Nebraskans, including myself, view TransCanada as an overly aggressive company who thought they could come in and intimidate and bully their way across our state. And having witnessed TransCanada's actions during the application process has made us wary of what they would do if they were empowered by a premature permit. And I fear that an early permit would place a tremendous amount of pressure on the state of Nebraska to hurry through its review process. TransCanada has been granted plenty of free passes and now they seek yet another. They want their political allies to free them from the tangled mess that they themselves helped to create. Perhaps it's time for the free passes to come to an end. If the Keystone XL truly has merit, then it should be able to withstand the rigorous and comprehensive review that it deserves and has not gotten. If this pipeline is built, thousands of us in the heartlands will have to live and work next to it for the rest of our lives, and probably for the rest of my kids' and my grandkids' lives. It will cross hundreds of our waterways, our lakes and streams, and it will only get riskier with the passage of time. Short-circuiting the review process would be an injustice and in fact, a gross injustice to all of us that have to live and work along the proposed path of this pipeline. Many of us feel that approval of this project would strip us of our individual property rights. We do not feel that a foreign corporation has any right to take our land for their private use and gain, especially when there has been no determination that this project is in the national interest. We have seen no evidence that this pipeline is anything other than an export pipeline providing access to the world oil market for Canadian tar sands. Outside of providing a few months of temporary employment for some Americans, it yields few other benefits. Mr. Terry himself, in a speech a week or two weeks ago in the state of Nebraska, said there would be no more than 30 permanent jobs as a result in the state of Nebraska as a result of the pipeline project. And we're being asked to risk some of our greatest national resources and a lot of folks' livelihoods, and we're going to get 30 permanent jobs. Completion of the pipeline would actually increase the price of the oil we are currently importing from Canada. This is an undisputed fact. I mean, really, does this make any sense? We help them build the pipeline, and as a result, we end up with higher oil and fuel prices in the Midwest. You know, why don't we just take the gun out and shoot ourselves in the foot? That would make more sense to me. Perhaps it's just my Nebraska logic but from my perspective, it appears that the United States is getting the short end of the stick on this deal. Canada and the big oil companies are reaping all the rewards, while Americans are being left behind to fix the fences. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Uh, we appreciate your opening statement. I'm going to defer my five minutes of questions and at this time recognize Mr. Pompeo of Kansas for his five minutes of questions. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I begin by uh, asking unanimous consent to enter into the record an article that appeared in the Wall Street Journal on uh, February 1st, written by Ted Olson. 
Thank you. Uh, you know, uh, I understand that Mr. Waxman doesn't like this pipeline. Uh, he called this hearing, he asked for witnesses to come. But the incredible political nature of it became really apparent when he had his chance to ask questions. He had five minutes. I watched the clock. He spent four minutes and 31 seconds testifying. So he drugged two folks out from the United States government, brought them here this morning, ostensibly because he was keenly interested. He thought it was absolutely critical that this committee hear from them. And he got between two and two and a half questions, depending on how you count them, 29 seconds. Uh, he, it, it didn't appear to me that there was anything but blatant politics, a chance for him to speak a little bit more about some folks who are constituents of mine. And he's applied this new standard. Mr. Waxman now has the benefit standard. He, his notion of legislation, apparently, is that you, you, you decide a piece of legislation depending on who benefits. Mr. Chairman, I want to make a point of order. I know the rules on the House floor would not permit the gentleman to make such a personal attack I, I on the member's uh, motivations or actions. I, 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 I'm happy to answer it when I get my turn, but if I answer it and don't have enough time for questions to these witnesses, he'll say I didn't ask them <laughs> enough questions. But I think it's inappropriate, and I make a point of order that the words be stricken. Mr. Waxman, I... Uh, Wait, uh, would the gentleman hold for one minute? Certainly. Unless the gentleman wants to withdraw those comments, and then he can go on with well, his question. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to withdraw them so that we can proceed this morning. That's fine. I'm happy, I'm happy to withdraw the comments. Uh, I, I, and I, uh, I withdraw my point of order. And the gentleman withdraw. Appreciate the gentleman withdraw this point. withdrawing his personal statements. Certainly. Um, we, 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 we have now this standard that is apparently being applied by folks across the aisle. Folks across the aisle have this news that says we, we try and decide whether there's a personal benefit, whether someone would or would not benefit uh, from a particular stance. This is a private investment, $7 billion private investment. But, you know, I, I watched, I wasn't here, but I watched this committee last year as we were debating and discussing. Uh, it was a little different. We didn't have hearings like this very often. Uh, but I watched them on the floor debate Obamacare and the stimulus package, and there was no discussion from the left about who might or might benefit from those takings from the taxpayer, um, those enormous government programs. And I just think, I just think it is um, intellectually desperate, dishonest, to, uh, to, to, to now for us to all have this different standard. We should have a standard about policy. We ought all to do that and not have a standard that, uh, where we say, hey, we're looking to see who benefits or who does not benefit from a particular piece of legislation. Uh, and with that, I yield back my time. Gentleman yields back the balance of his time. At this time, I recognize the gentleman from California for five minutes of questions. Now, Mr. Chairman, before I get to questions, I want to point out that uh, since it's been commented that I'm being political, the chairman of the subcommittee uh, raised the issue of whether the president is in the full campaign mode trying to respond to these extremists in the environmental side, attributing his motives for that, and he said this is all presidential politics and suggested that perhaps we ought to look at uh, Mr. Soros, uh, who has a train that could take this tar sands pipe oil down to uh, Texas instead of using a pipeline. Well, my point was never that it was Mr. transported Buff it. I it was just Mr. Like Buffett, not Mr. Soros. Oh, excuse me, the other, uh, the other guy that you don't like, Mr. Buffett, <laughs> Mr. Soros, Mr. Buffett. So I, I consider that a, a, an ad hominem political kind of argument. But my Republican colleagues in the American Petroleum Institute make several arguments for building this pipeline. They say, we need the oil, it will lower gas prices, it will make us more secure as a nation. But the facts just don't support these claims. Uh, the Energy Information Agency, which is part of the Department of Energy, is projecting that, what America, that America's oil consumption is no longer growing. It's no longer growing. And the reason it's no longer growing is because we've insisted on more efficient automobiles that have better fuel mileage. The standards for these model years 2017 through 2025 will further reduce our oil dependence. So with growth and consumption now in check, I don't think we have to be stampeded into something like this uh, oil tar sands deal from Canada. This pipeline will not reduce gas prices. In fact, 
Last year, TransCanada admitted to this subcommittee that the pipeline will raise crude oil prices in the Midwest. There is a debate over how much it will raise those prices, but certainly it won't lower them. So that leaves the question of national security as a, as a reason why we need to go along with this pipeline. And um, we have General Anderson. Uh, could you just briefly state what your uh, experience, your relevant military experience has been? Uh, 31 years service in the Army. I'm a professional logistician. Uh, most, uh, most recently served in the Pentagon for two years as the Chief of Logistics Operations and Readiness in the Pentagon. And before that, I was General David Petraeus's uh, senior logistics officer of the multinational force Iraq C-4. In your statement, you said that you didn't think this uh, pipeline was in our national security interest. You said that America's oil dependence threatens our national security. Uh, is, this a na is this a controversial view, view among national security experts? I don't think so. Certainly, uh, uh, although I'm not sure if I'd call myself a national security expert, I am an expert in regards to experiencing the operational impacts of our oil addiction in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, and I still do work in Afghanistan. I sp have spent quite a bit of time over there uh, with my private interests, and I can tell you that uh, we haven't changed at all in 10 years over there. We're still incredibly wasteful and inefficient, and we don't have any of the renewable energy technologies that I believe we need to save soldiers' lives. This is uh, not oil that's coming out of Canada that's going to be put through a pipeline in, through the United States. This is a different kind of oil. It comes from tar sands and, um, uh, and therefore can have problems in the pipeline. Uh, the uh, Trans-Canada has already one pipeline. It's been around for, uh, I think, a, a year and a half. And they've already had 14 spills over the last year and a half. Um, so a lot of people are concerned about the safety of the pipeline, but that's a pipeline that's not carrying these, this, this uh, crude oil tar sands, if, I'm, if, I, if I understand it, the situation. It's not going to carry this kind of tar sands. And to get the tar sands ready to go through any pipeline, there has to be such a use of energy to refine it sufficiently to go through the pipeline that it's going to cause us more... Uh, uh, greenhouse gases adding to uh, climate change problems. Is that the way you see it? That's exactly the way I see it, sir, and I think that uh, it's very detrimental to this nation to continue the CO2 emissions that, uh, that we are doing and, and will no doubt do with the encouragement of this pipeline because I believe that ultimately brings about climate change and global instability. And when that happens, I think the likelihood that soldiers like myself will have to fight and die uh, in order to protect the stability of this nation, of, of the world, uh, is is, high, is is much more likely. Uh, the threat of tar sands oil spills from Trans Canada's pipeline is another reason a lot of people oppose it. And Mr. Michael Klink, who's an engineer and a safety inspector for Trans Canada's first Keystone pipeline that had those 14 spills, wrote an op-ed, uh, and that uh, in the Lincoln Journal, Journal Star which I would like to have put into the record. And he describes seeing the first Keystone pipeline constructed with cheap foreign steel that cracked when workers tried to weld it. I'd like to ask unanimous consent that ought to be. Um, and I also have a, a, a letter. This, this is a, in addition to his uh, uh, op-ed. I also have a letter from Mr. Klink that I would also ask unanimous consent be put in the record. Without objection. My, my time has ex expired. I want to thank the two gentlemen, uh, Mr. Thompson and General Anderson, for their testimony. I think that we ought to hear another side to this issue, not have it ramroded through the Congress, not have it given the special interest uh, treatment. This is a big decision. We're going to be living with the consequences for maybe 50 to 100 years, and it's in the wrong direction that's going to take our nation in terms of greenhouse gases, in terms of carbon emissions, in terms of pipeline safety, in terms of danger to the, to the people who, where the, uh, around the pipeline, uh, and the taking of the property for those people whose property is going to be taken for this special interest purpose. I yield back the balance gentleman, of my time. The gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Griffith, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and I do appreciate uh, you gentlemen taking your time to be with us today. Uh, we may disagree on some of this, but I do appreciate you all as American citizens exercising your rights under our Constitution to speak to your government and, and do, do commend you for being here. 
Uh, I do have uh, some issues with uh, some of the comments about jobs. You know, we can always argue over the numbers, but, but one thing that, that I find just really interesting is, is that if you accept the argument that folks are going to, the oil is going to come in and then the oil is going to go out to other countries and this is just a pipeline to send the oil somewhere else, if that argument is accepted, the, you also have to accept the argument that, that before it goes to the other countries, it's going to be refined in the United States, thus as adding value. To do that, you have to add jobs to add that value. And when you add that value, you add strength in our economy and tax dollars. So I recognize that the situation you have, Mr. Thompson, uh, being personal and there are property rights involved, and I have not personally looked at that. But what I do see is a significant situation where it's been studied for a long time. And I do believe that there are jobs that are uh, created by having the Keystone XL pipeline. And I think a lot of the opposition, not necessarily yours, but others, are folks who, who do not feel that we should continue to use carbon-based energy. Uh, I think that uh, the general falls into that category, and I don't agree with that. Uh, coming from a coal-rich and a natural gas-rich area of the United States, uh, I would be remiss if I didn't, didn't tell you that I think that at least for the foreseeable future, we're going to need to use oil, we're going to need to use coal, we're going to need to use natural gas. While we should be looking at uh, green energy sources long term, I certainly wouldn't want to put us in a situation where our military had to rely on solar panels in order to provide it with the energy that it needs to move forward. Certainly something that we should look at long term, but I think over the next 20 years we're still going to need our carbon-based fuels. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. This time I recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Gonzalez, for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and I want to thank uh, the witnesses. And <clears throat> I'm going to agree uh, with my colleague that uh, if you're exporting fuels, and because it's refri refined product from obviously what we receive from Canada, uh, exporting is good. Balance of trade creates jobs and such. Uh, the real question then comes as to how you refine it. And I just want to remind my colleagues on the other side of the aisle that we attempted to make sure that we did it in a more uh, a cleaner fashion in more safe fashion, and that they uh, opposed us every step of the way. Now, we were able to get a bill out of, of the House, uh, but we have never have been able to conclude that. So I'm hoping that they recognize uh, the necessity of a safe and clean refining industry in this country in the way that we can accomplish and meet all of the demands of this country. Uh, General Anderson, is that right? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, again, thank you for your service, first of all, and thank you for being here today. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. It's good to hear from you. I understand what you're saying, and I'm going to agree with you. This is my fear. I'm for the Keystone. I'm from Texas, so you know that I still believe in fossil fuel. The question is, how much longer will we still require a reliable source of, so of fossil fuel in this country? I understand that many of the studies that are published come from the oil companies, and they'll tell you that we're going to have uh, domestic um, dependence for some years to come, and globally even for a longer period of time. I share your fear that my support of Keystone may well simply expand the duration of the time that we may be still dependent. My position is we will be important because we need it, and I'd rather get it from Canada and Mexico than anyone else for national security purposes. But that does not mean that we should not continue to aggressively view efficiency and conservation, renewables, and alternatives. So I agree with you. There has to be a healthy balance to be able to accomplish this. To my colleagues on the other side of the fence, uh, fence the problem is that you truly just have a, almost a 100 percent dedication to fossil fuels. As much as I understand that they have to be part of the fix, I'm going to give you a quote from John Quigley, former Secretary of Pennsylvania Department of Conservation and Natural Resources, in making reference to how we explore today for fossil fuels and such. He says, we are burning the furniture to heat the house. And that's the caution. That's a cautionary tale to all of us. Be realistic about our needs in the future, how we wean ourselves from the dependency on fossil fuel. Everyone is going to tell you that 
uh, exploration, production, and refining of fossil fuels is a twilight industry. But I'm here to tell you that it's a real long twilight. And we can't afford to be caught without an adequate supply and be depending on individuals, uh, countries, that will be in jeopardy and in a flux for years to come. So I do agree with you, and I, and I thank you again for your observation. Mr. Thompson, I do have a question about you. There are a lot of complaints about regulation and such in this country, about its, its onerous, its overburdened. The greatest exercise of governmental regulation is eminent domain, and you've made reference to that. So I want to know, have you been approached by TransCanada to negotiate anything regarding some possible use of your property? Absolutely. Can you tell me about that experience? Yes. Um, we were first notified verbally that they intended to use eminent domain if we didn't go along with the offer that they had presented us for the use of our property. We uh, definitely declined to do enter into any kind of agreement with them. So they followed up with a written letter expressly stating that if we did not accept the terms of the agreement that they had sent to us, that they, if we did not accept those terms within 30 days, that they would then immediately proceed to take our land through eminent domain. And my problem with that, sir, they were still in the permitting process at this time. And yet they are threatening me with eminent domain. And they did this throughout the state of Nebraska. And I'll guarantee you, sir, that many, many of the easements that landowners signed was due to the fact that TransCanada told them, threatened them with eminent domain. And there's not too many ranchers or any other ordinary citizens that are willing to take on a, a multi-billion dollar corporation, as we well know. Well, keep us so posted, it, Mr. Thompson. I would ask you that. My time is up, okay. and, that's, and I hate cutting you off, but I thank you. I thank you, General. I yield back. Uh, I'm going to continue to defer on my questions, and I'll recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. Bilbray, for five minutes. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, General Anderson, I appreciate your concerns about you know, global environmental issues. Um, your concern about this pipeline and its short-term and long-term impact, I think, is very, you know, is what we want to talk about. Uh, do you feel that the um, the construction of the Alaskan pipeline in the 70s was um, detrimental to the national security? Uh, I think at that time uh, that was the right thing to do. Um, but different, much different situation, of course. Uh, now um, the world has changed. Um, and greenhouse gases and climate change and world instability are all these things that are much more in the forefront than they were 40, 50 years ago when we con contemplated the Alaska pipeline. General, you think that the, envir the, you know, the physics of environmental reality and the reality of the political instability of places like the Middle East have changed dramatically since we, the Congress voted on that pipeline? I'm not sure if I understand what you're... I'm just saying, I'm saying, again, do you believe that the physics of environmental, environmental impact, um, issues like climate change, issues like emissions, um, toxic emissions and everything else, and the, the situations that have historically been um, unstable in the Middle East, do you think that there wasn't those issues weren't um, at least, if not perceived, weren't, weren't reality at that time also? No, I don't think that they were, to, to, they were as developed um, as they are today, as apparent as they are today. I don't think we knew back then the impact of, of uh, CO2 emissions. We didn't know. Them. That's we my point. It was, we we might not have not known. But the fact is, is that it was still there. Wouldn't you agree? I would concede you that point, yes. What's, um, do you believe the, um, the use or, and or the development and expansion of the use of nuclear power is um, a um, contributing to the national 
security, or do you think that it de is a detriment to the national security? I agree. I, I, I consider nuclear power to be clean energy, and I, I support its development. And I appreciate you using that, because one of the frustrations I have, as somebody who's worked in clean air, is people mix the word renewable as if it's all clean and deny clean energies across the line. And as you know, the number one purchaser of nuclear reactors in this country is the United States government. Um, and I appreciate that. Do you believe that um, the mandated use of ethanol aids in the security of this country um, and its uh, long-term uh, environmental and economic and military stability? Not really. No, I don't really uh, believe that. In other words, you, you go along with those of us that um, have addressed the issue in California that ethanol is not only a very expensive, non-sustainable uh, option, but it's also a polluting option through its evaporative emissions and related issues that was not clarified when the mandate occurred here in Washington. I would agree with that. E even though those of us in California tried to wor warn Washington of this environmental and economic impact. Yeah. I, w I would agree with that. Of course, I'm not an expert in this field. I'm talking about national security. I understand that, but we're getting back to this issue of how energy policy affects it. Um, would you agree that giving ethanol all of the benefits or the overwhelming majority of benefits like tax credits, um, blenders, fuels, and everything else, while denying other environmental options such as al algae, the same package, is counterproductive to the stated purpose of na uh, national in, in, um, energy independence? I would agree with that. Well, I want to thank you very much for your testimony, and I, I appreciate that um, we approach the challenges. I would um, ask that uh, the record show the general very clear about the fact that what some people perceived as being environmentally damaging in Washington may not be perceived by the general or myself of um, uh, being not only damaging but maybe absolutely essential for environmental and national se security purposes, and I appreciate it, General. I yield back. The gentleman yields back, this time recognize the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Markey, for five minutes. The Keystone Pipeline would carry some of the dirtiest oil in the world right through the middle of our country. It is a double barrel threat to the environment, pumping out millions of tons of the pollutants that cause global warming, while also risking oil spills into our groundwater. We have been repeatedly told that approving this pipeline would lower gas prices at the pump, even though TransCanada projects that oil prices and its profits would rise because it can charge more for Keystone oil in the Gulf than it does in the Midwest. We have also been repeatedly told to get over our concerns because the oil coming through this pipeline would enable us to reduce our dependence on oil imported from unfriendly Middle Eastern nations. But it turns out that these energy benefits may be a complete fiction. Many of the refineries where the Keystone crude will be sent say they will re-export the refined fuels. They are also located in Port Arthur, Texas, which is a designated foreign trade zone. This means that when these refineries re-export the Keystone oil fuels, they won't even have to pay U.S. taxes on those exports. And in December, when I asked the President of TransCanada whether he would agree to ensure that the oil and refined fuels stay here in the United States instead of being re-exported, he said no. General Anderson, last month, Canadian Prime Minister Stephen Harper said that, quote, when you look at the Iranians threatening to block the Straits of Hormuz, I think that just illustrates how critical it is that supply for the United States be North American. General, do you think that this bill to legislate a permit for the Keystone Pipeline is guaranteed to reduce our dependence on oil transported through the Straits of Hormuz if we don't have some provision which ensures that the oil stays here in the United States. No, I do not believe that it will guarantee uh, uh, energy security at all for our nation. The American Petroleum Institute has cited our friendly relationship with Canada and polls that find that Americans would prefer to import more oil from Canada. Under this bill, are there any guarantees 
that all of the friendly Canadian oil that is sent through the pipeline will be sold here in the United States. No, I'm not aware of any guarantees that that will happen. So what I'm hearing you saying then is that there's a threat because they're extracting the oil from tar, that there's a greater likelihood of a dangerous warming uh, uh, on the planet, and that the benefits as the pipeline goes through our country uh, are not certain in terms of the oil staying here in our country to break our dependence upon imported oil. And so what is the benefit to the American people out of such a proposal? There is no benefit. I believe it's a detriment to the American people. And again, summarize why is it a detriment? The detriment because it keeps our, our uh, addiction to oil. And our addiction to oil uh, makes us strategically and operationally vulnerable. Okay, Mr. Thompson, um, the route that TransCanada originally proposed would have gone through Nebraska's Sand Hills. Even if a new proposed route would avoid the Sand Hills, won't it still go through the Ogala Aquifer? We, uh, well, we don't know where they're proposing a new route, so that's a problem. Uh, from what I've heard and what initial proposals they were talking about, uh, it would still cross the Ogallala Aquifer, even and though what, it was out what is of the, the sand What is hills. the risk if that happens, if there's a spill? Absolutely there's a risk if that happens. And what would happen to the, to the uh, water table? Well, if I could quickly explain that uh, our water table is so high that the pipeline would actually be buried or submerged directly in the water in many places. Wow. And so if any type of leak, it's going to go into our water supply. Wow. And what would the impact of that be? Well, it could be from small to tremendous. I mean, you've got all kinds of small communities, and like myself, I have uh, livestock watering wells, I have irrigation wells that would be close to the pipeline. They become contaminated. That property is becomes virtually useless. And how do you feel about that in terms of the impact it could have upon your life and the lives of all the people in those smaller communities? Well, you know, to put it bluntly, it, I'm angry as hell when people want to play political football games with my livelihood. Well, we agree with you. We want Nebraska, the University of Nebraska, to have a good football team, but we don't <laughs> want oil companies to be playing football games You're you know, absolutely with correct. people in Nebraska, and we can see how their public health could really be in jeopardy. But I, I just think, you know, somewhere in this process, we need to take a look at the people of America that are actually going to be, uh, you know, impacted by this thing. It's not all about money and this and that. I mean, there's people's livelihoods at stake here, and I mean thousands of us, and our resources. So that needs to enter the debate somewhere uh, in the process. Thank you, sir, for being here. Thank you, General, Thank for you. being here. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. <coughs> Gentlemen's time has expired. Uh, I'll now recognize myself for five minutes. <coughs> and the first thing I want to do is read from a memorandum from Carmine Figlio, who's Ph.D., Deputy Assistant Secretary for Policy Analysis at the U.S. Department of Energy. And in this memo, he specifically talks about the issue that Mr. Markey raised, and that is this oil coming from Canada is going to be ended up exported out of the U.S. And I'm going to read this verbatim. Uh, he said, this memorandum provides data and analysis about a number of issues. It concludes that refiners in the U.S. will likely consume additional Canadian oil sands well in excess of what would be provided by the Keystone XL pipeline. It also concludes that exports of Canadian oil sands from Port Arthur are highly unlikely. Um, now, when you hear this argument that, as the President stated in his decision not to make a decision, he said that one of the reasons he was not going to make a decision was that he did not have sufficient information to make a decision, that Congress did not give him enough time. <clears throat> well, as I had stated in my opening statement, this pipeline has now been under study for 40 uh, months. In the fall of 2011, a supplemental draft environmental impact statement was issued by the State Department. 
After months of public hearings along the proposed route, the State Department issued its final environmental impact statement. And in that final environmental impact statement, between two options, one of not building the pipeline versus two building the pipeline, they indicated that the preferred option was to build the pipeline as proposed. Now, a person just on the outside not paying any attention to this, once this, everyone expected the State Department was going to make its final decision uh, sometime in the fall of 2011, and then all of a sudden unannounced, they said that they would seek a new route through the state of Nebraska and undergo another round of studies that would not be complete until the first quarter of 2013. And that was the stated reason for President Obama not making the decision was that uh, b because of this new route through Nebraska. Now, when some of the political leaders in Nebraska realized their concerns were being used by the President to stop this project, they had a special session of the legislature was called and a new law was passed to give the Nebraska Department of Environmental Quality the ability to cite and evaluate a new route for the pipeline within Nebraska's borders in half the time frame that the State Department envisioned. So taking that development into account, the keystone provision that was put into the Temporary Payroll Tax Cut Extension Act allowed the President to approve the pipeline while the state of Nebraska completed its environmental review. The final environmental impact statement that the State Department issued in August of 2011 was deemed satisfactory of all National Environmental Policy Act requirements, and no additional federal review should be required. Because the route modification of this long pipeline is in Nebraska is not an interstate modification, there really was no federal role. And since the rest of the pipeline route outside of Nebraska and its evaluated environmental impact remain unchanged, there was really no reason for the White House or State Department to believe that there was not enough time to make the decision of the pipeline by February 21st. And I simply wanted to talk about that because when per people hear, oh, well, the roots uh, changed and that's why we don't have enough time. Uh, but there was a clear explanation of all of this and I think I uh, clearly stated it. Uh, in concluding, I would just say that General Anderson, we genuinely appreciate your being here. Uh, I would also like to uh, thank you for your support uh, and service to our country. And Mr. Thompson, we appreciate your being here and speaking up uh, on your uh, personal views about this issue. And uh, uh, Nebraska is in the Big Ten now, right? Or Big 12, right? Okay. So we know they'll continue to do well. And uh, we will keep the record open for, how many, for 10 days for any additional material that might want to be submitted. And uh, with that, we'll conclude the hearing and thank you all very much for your assistance in helping us out. With that, the hearing's concluded.